Okay, uh, so we'll begin. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, hello to everyone who watches uh, in the recording. Today, we will uh, go into, I think, uh, one of the most important aspects of uh, robotics, um, control. Uh, so let me uh, just quickly notice that uh, while we had uh, a co whole course on control theory, that course was covering a linear control. Linear control uh, was mostly on uh, linear systems, which is, uh, and the whole content of that course uh, was true, the concepts of, uh, and useful, the concepts were applicable to robotics, but it required linear systems to work with. We learned how to linearize systems. So as long as you can linearize a robotic system, you can apply concepts from linear control. Linearization does not imply uh, the same properties as original nonlinear systems. So, so in order to, for us to prove anything about the original system, we have to do something more than just linearization. Okay. And uh, that is often exactly what we want. And often this can be done. So today I will show you a few examples of when uh, such concepts as uh, feedback control and stability can be naturally um, used in context of nonlinear systems directly without linearization. So in a sense, we'll do similar stuff to linear control, but specifically for systems with uh, nonlinear dynamics. You would see how I do it, and uh, that will somehow give you like an idea of how things like that can be done. That is uh, that is the idea for today's lecture. All right. So, without further ado, let us jump in and see uh, how things like that are done. So, first, uh, let us consider. Uh, you know, I think we have seen this uh, before. But let us uh, quickly review. It's only one slide that you have probably seen before. Let us consider uh, the idea of Lipunov stability. Okay. So here's a criteria for asymptotic stability. A system x dot equals to f of x is asymptotically stable if there exists a scalar function v of x equal to uh, which is bigger than zero, uh, okay, so f x dot equals f of x is asymptotically stable if there exists a positive scalar function of x whose time derivative v dot of x is always negative, with the important caveat that at zero, both the function and the derivatives are also zero. So notice what we said was, you want a uniformly positive uh, function with a zero at the origin, okay? Uh, so function, for example, v equals to 10 will not be sufficient because it is not uniformly uh, positive. It, it is uniformly positive, but it's uh, it is not zero at the origin. Okay, and its time derivative has to be uh, always negative. So let me remind you what does it mean to take a time derivative of a scalar function uh, like this. Well, we do it as a chain rule. We say v dot equals to dv dx times x dot. And x dot, we know what it is. x dot is this. So time derivative of v would be dv dx times f of x. That is how uh, the function is connected to the uh, original equation. 
original equation provides a vector field for the function with f of x. So that is the thing. Okay. So you have to be careful how you choose uh, those functions and uh, in order to satisfy both of those criteria. It is not uh, just any function that it satisfies. Right. Okay, so that is asymptotic stability. Just find a positive function with negative derivative. Uh, zero is origin. You proved asymptotic stability. Now, for marginal stability, what you have uh, is, uh, you know, you, have, you need to find uh, for this dynamics if uh, function positive such that its derivative is negative or equal to zero. So if you didn't manage to find uh, this function, this function, but instead found this function, so you, instead of finding a function with a derivative strictly negative, except at zero, you found a function which is non-positive, that proved marginal stability. So this function, v of x, is called Lyapunov function. Lyapunov function. So a function that proves stability in the sense of Lyapunov is called a Lyapunov function. All right, all right, so. Is, is this somehow uh, like at least a little bit clear? We'll see it in applications. I guess we'll see uh, how, how this leads to practical results. Okay. Let's immediately see one application. Let us consider a basic uh, dynamical system, second order dynamical system. This is a linear system. Uh, we could do eigenvalue analysis in the system. Okay. We could do eigenvalue analysis on the system. But uh, let's just instead um, simply uh, do a Lepunov. Uh, directly on this. The, this is, you can think of it as a extension of the simple oscillator. You remember simple oscillator is a mass times x double dot plus mu viscous friction coefficient times x dot plus kx equal to zero, right? A mass with a spring, simple oscillator. Well, this is the extension, but uh, to you know, matrices. Okay, vectors. Uh, we consider KD and KP to be positive semi-definite matrices. Uh, remember, when we say that matrix is big, bigger than zero, uh, we usually imply that it's semi-definite. We don't usually mean that each element is positive. Uh, that would be an exception. So usually what this means is the matrix is semi-definite. There is a fancy way to write it, but uh, uh, you know this is overwhelming majority of the cases when uh, um, bigger or less than sign uh, is used with matrices. So it makes a lot of sense to uh, just use it to define uh, some definiteness, not like element-wise inequality. Excuse me, but yes. isn't uh, semi uh, defines also? Um, yeah, yeah, it is definite. In Positive. the sign, it should be equal. Yes, yes, yes. I think there, there is a there is a mistake. There is a mistake here. It should be they are definite matrices. You are right. You are absolutely right. I apologize. This is uh, yeah. This is a typo, and uh, it has to do with me working with. Uh, um, uh, optimization problems, whereas the idea of difference between definiteness and semi-definiteness blurs away. But you're right, uh, they are definite matrices. They are, definite, uh, they are positive definite matrices. Okay. Uh, good catch, good catch. So can we try to analyze stability of the system? Well, let me propose 
to you uh, to do it with the following Klebanov function. Following Klebanov function, we will uh, use Klebanov function with one half of q dot times q dot plus one half of q times kp times q. So we will uh, analyze Klebanov stability with uh, this function. How did I get this function? Well, you will see uh, later on there is a repeating pattern on, on how to choose Lipnov functions. And I think uh, it will be clear. It is not a rule. It is kind of like art. Uh, but uh, it is so typical that you you know, you would observe how it's done by, from examples. OK, let's uh, consider derivative of this function. So derivative of this function can be found as this. Uh, so uh, remember the function itself is q dot times q dot. What is the derivative of q dot times q dot? Time derivative. Well, it is uh, one half. Remember one half, right? Well, let, let me even go just go previous slide and we'll see it by, by ourselves. What is the derivative of this component? Well, it is q double dot times q dot plus q dot times q double dot. But those are scalars. So you can uh, transpose each of them, right? You can transpose each of them. And uh, that means they are like, they're the same, basically. So q dot times q double dot is equal to q double dot times q dot. So you sum them together and you get rid of this one half. Does it make sense? I'll just show it once and then we'll move on. I, I just don't want there to be like confusion about it. So what we will have when we take derivative of this component, we'll have one half of, uh, you know, ddq times dq. I'm uh, leaving the transposes here. I, I guess I can show them like this. Right? Plus one half of uh, dq times dq. Okay. That is uh, what the derivative would be of uh, derivative of specifically this part of this part okay but that is the same as uh just dq times dq why because this component is the same as this component transposed right if you transpose this, they will change places, and one of them will obtain a transpose sign. But uh, they are the same because they're scalars. You can transpose a scalar without changing anything. You remember, transpose is just flip across the diagonal. Scalar is the only element across the diagonal. So diagonal elements don't change when you transpose them. So uh, this is the same, and you get this expression. This is how we uh, take derivative here. Here it will be exactly the same situation, uh, except uh, you know, uh, yeah, you would just have it like q times kp times q dot. Uh, dot will appear here and here. One uh, you can again say it is a scalar, so transpose equals to itself, and that is how you get rid of one half. Okay, hope this explained it somehow. Hope it explained it uh, somehow. All right. Now, uh, this is how we obtained this expression here and this expression here. But we also know what q double dot is. q double dot is from the dynamics is equal to minus kd q dot minus kp q. Okay. So this guy 
can go here. You put a substitute into this equation. And that is how you get uh, the expression for this is a derivative of a Lipunov function. So where this particular part came from uh, knowing what dynamics is, it is uh, this q double dot. And this is just from differentiation. OK. But when we open the brackets, notice there is a minus sign here, q dot here. There is a kp and q. What will happen is that we will get the exact same expression as this, except it will be transposed and with a minus sign. Or well, transposition, as we argued already, uh, can be always done on a scalar, and this is a scalar, so you can always transpose it. And uh, minus sign remains. So what you have is uh, essentially q transpose kp q dot minus q transpose kp q dot is zero. They go away. So you can say that this expression this expression go away because of this minus sign. So what remains is this this thing. And that is what we have here. So now you, I think you understand why in the original Lyapunov function we used kp. We knew that we wanted to, it to go away after uh, we, uh, you know, did all those operations. And that's why why we uh, said uh, let's make the Lyapunov function equals to q dot squared times q kp q. This q kp q meant uh, to cancel out. So one trick for you uh, for your first use, you want uh, something to cancel out. See if you can add it to the Lipunov function. Okay, uh, that is the first trick. Now, what we got unfortunately is not a proof of asymptotic stability. Why? Well, this function is very interesting. Uh, it is only se negative semi-definite, so non-positive, because q dot will be equal to zero for any q, or v dot will be equal to zero for any q dot equal to zero. Uh, oh, sorry, for, as long as q dot is equal to zero and q uh, is uh, anything. So basically, uh, with uh, we don't only have uh, v dot equal to zero at the origin. It is also equal to zero at any zero velocities. As long as velocity is zero, uh, q, uh, v, v dot is zero. So this doesn't prove asymptotic stability. But <laughs> there is such thing as LaSalle theorem. I think sometimes it is called Krasovsky theorem. Uh, probably there is a ton of other names, but uh, I think the popular ones is LaSalle principle, Krasovsky theorem, something like this. The theorem itself is stated uh, quite in a quite complicated manner. In a quite complicated manner. But I think the essence of the principle goes kind of like this. If you have a dynamical system and you have a Lyapunov function which proves its marginal stability, marginal stability, okay, then as long as there are no trajectories in the space of fixed points, by space of fixed points, I mean if you uh, where your system does not change, so where your uh, state coordinates remain fixed, right? So q is equal to constant, q dot hence equal to zero, q dot equals to zero. So that is fixed point. So if in the space of fixed points, there are no trajectories other than zero trajectory, so q equals to zero is the only trajectory in the uh, space of fixed points, 
trajectory means something that you can substitute into your dynamics and it will solve the differential equation. Then the system is asymptotically stable. Uh, the idea, uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to prove it, but the idea goes, I think, uh, you know, you can kind of visualize it like this. What does marginal stability tell you? Well, it tells you uh, it is not, uh, the system is not going to spiral into zero. Instead, it is going to stay somewhere. It's not going to spiral out, right? It's going to stay somewhere. So it is quite possible for the system to arrive somewhere and stay there. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, Lasalle's principle asks, but where? You said it is going to stay somewhere, but where? And if you can prove that the only place where it can stay is the origin, then you prove the symptomatic stability, just not with Lipunov functions, but with combination of Lipunov and Lasalle's theorem or Lasalle's principle. That is kind of uh, like the simplified. Um, you know, way of thinking about it. I encourage you to, of course, read the uh, original, like, you know, the textbooks, uh, look uh, at the definitions and so on and so forth. But they're intimidating. So that's why I want uh, a little bit of a, you know, simple, simple view. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, to use Lasalle's uh, theorem, let us consider fixed point. Fixed point is very, again, Q dot, Q double dot, I equal to zero. Uh, if this is true, so the, if Q equals to zero is the only fixed point for the system, then we can uh, prove that uh, it is asymptotically stable. Let's try it. So if Q dot, Q, uh, Q double dot are zero, then this ex equation becomes this equation. Okay. So we lose this component because it is zero, this component because q dot is zero, and we only get kp equals to q. Okay, but kp is positive definite. Since it is positive definite, it means that it is full rank. Positive definite matrices are all full rank. That uh, is, by the way, can you, you can prove it just from definition of what it means to be positive definite. I will leave it to you. But yeah, positive definite matrices are for rank. Uh, those, this is the types of proofs that are just fun to do. Um, this is just fun to do. Especially if you know, for example, that positive definite matrices can always be represented as a product of two positive definite matrices. Uh, symmetric, of course. We're talking about symmetric ones. Uh, uh, as a product, sorry, of two, uh, of, uh, of, as a square of one positive definite matrix that allows you to have very elegant proofs. All right. So anyway, KP is full rank because this positive definite. So it has trivial null space. What do I mean by trivial null space? Well, it means that uh, the only uh, zero, the only vector that sends the output to zero is zero. You don't have any other vectors in the null space. Hence, for this to be true, Q has to be equal to zero because there is no other vector in the null space, only zero. So Q has to be zero. If null space wasn't trivial, then uh, you could find other Qs that would send it to zero and uh, we couldn't use Lasalle. Okay. So the system is asymptotically stable, not just marginally stable. That is quite interesting, right? Uh, we find that um, apparently uh, the system is uh, asymptotically stable as long as those two are uh, positive definite matrices. And that is quite similar to what we saw with uh, asymptotic oh, sorry, with oscillator. Remember, if the mass is positive, uh, if the uh, viscous coefficient is positive. If the spring coefficient is positive, then the system is stable. And here we proved it for arbitrary, arbitrary system. Sounds great. Sounds great. And uh, to prove it, however, it wasn't sufficient to invoke Lepunov 
method we also needed LaSalle, and that is a theme uh, for robotics in general. You have to use LaSalle somehow. All right, all right. Questions so far? LaSalle's invariance principle is going here, isn't it? Questions so far? All right, so no, no questions, and I move on. Um, let us now consider something a little bit more advanced than simple oscillator. So let us consider manipulating. Uh, we learned those equations last time. We learned them last time. And today we'll finally see why we needed this C matrix here. Now we see why, why we needed it. <laughs> we we'll also see we don't need to compute it. Uh, just we need to know that it exists. Okay. So here I propose, I want to prove stability of the system. I don't know what tau is. Uh, I will, so I will prop, I will, what I will do is I will prove that there exists such tau that the system can be stable and I will propose a particular tau. So tau I will propose while considering stability. Okay. So we propose a Lyapunov function of this kind. Let us study this Lyapunov function. First, this here is a kinetic energy. This is a kinetic energy. That is uh, no doubt about it. Remember the definition of kinetic energy last lecture uh, was that uh, it was Q dot H Q dot. This is how we got this H here. So kinetic energy has um, uh, a generalized inertia matrix H as its quadratic form matrix. Okay, so this is the kinetic energy. This is the same Kp as before. Now, why is Kp here? We didn't have Kp anywhere here. Interesting, interesting. Well, uh, we will use Kp here. Uh, we, we will be able to uh, think, uh, you know, we'll be able to uh, think about it uh, later, but uh, this is what we propose. Just have KP here. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is another pattern you can start to notice. First pattern is we had uh, here something that looks like kinetic energy. And why do we have H? Or well, because why do we have H here? Because it stands in front of Q double dot. Last time we had identity in front of Q double dot, and we had identity here. So one pattern. Uh, so here we have something that looks like generalized inertia matrix. And here we always have KP, uh, KP. Another pattern. Just notice those. There are no rules. It is uh, finding Lepino functions is art, so you have to kind of look at the patterns. Okay, now let's find derivative of this guy. Let's find a derivative of this guy. First, uh, as before, when we differentiate this uh, component, what we have is something like this. How? Because we will have to, uh, but this time not. <laughs> This time not so simple. This time we get this. Uh, how? How? Uh, well, uh, first we say it is one half q double dot times h times q dot. Okay. S second we say it is q dot times h times q double dot. Those two we combine together and we get this part here. Uh, one half goes away because doesn't matter where dot is here or here, it is still just something that is can be transposed to get from one to another, the scalar. So that's how we get the scale. 
But now H itself is also a uh, matrix that has a time derivative, right? So when we take full uh, time derivative of this thing, we have it is a derivative. It is a derivative of three functions, not a product of three functions, not two. So we get this guy here with Q dot. So this this h here leads to h dot here. So we have this component one half Q dot transposed h dot Q dot. That is what happens. Right? So we have two components. Okay, and as before, nothing changes with this guy uh, from previous uh, derivation. It uh, produces this Q dot transpose KP Q. Cool. Now we know again as before what Q double dot is. Q double dot is uh, not even that. We we can do one better. Uh, we know what H Q double dot is. So H Q double dot is uh, tau minus C Q dot plus minus G. Oh, by the way, here we there is a mistake here. The, this is a minus sign here. This is a minus sign. It is corrected down downwards somewhere. Yeah, here it is correct. But yeah, there's a minus sign here. Okay. Okay. So this is what we get. This is what we get. And uh, this just carries on from the previous expression. Now we can isolate uh, and uh, we can kind of recombine. Let me uh, show you. We can recombine uh, two components, this component and this component. We can recombine them in this fashion. So notice that uh, both of those are quadratic forms with respect to Q dot. Quadratic forms with respect to Q dot. So what we have is uh, one half of h dot with a positive sign minus two uh, two c c is, comes from here two is because we don't have one half so one half times two is one and that's what we have here one so uh, we have this one half q dot h dot minus two c q dot plus this just carries on from the previous we don't do anything here. All right, now there is the interesting property that uh, I didn't tell you last time, but uh, it exists. This matrix H dot minus two, uh, minus two C is somehow skew symmetric. We can try to prove it. You remember those two matrices H dot and uh, C are closely related. How are they related? Well, they both can be obtained uh, as partial derivatives of uh, H matrix, right? C is obtained with Kronecker, uh, Kronecker symbols, um, with a quite complicated procedure, like recombining var various partial derivatives of uh, components of H. And H dot is, uh, again, partial derivatives of the components of H. And in both cases, those components are multiplied by various q dots so uh, it makes sense that the those matrices somehow have a pattern have a pattern they're dependent okay and uh i'm not going to prove it but uh, it can be proven that h dot minus 2c is q symmetric is q symmetric what does it mean for it to be skew symmetric well it means that uh, quadratic form of a skew symmetric matrix is zero. That is interesting property. So h dot minus two c multiplied on the uh, right, right and on the left by q dot gives us zero. Quadratic form of a skew symmetric matrix is zero. So this whole thing is zero. That is a trick 
that you also, uh, you know, would be well advised to remember. This trick is often used to simplify expressions for uh, Lyapunov function derivations. And this trick with skew-symmetricity is very standard in discussing stability of mechanical systems. Okay, so skew-symmetric, so it goes to zero. Now, all we have left is this component. Is this component. This is all we have. Before I go to the next slide, do we have questions? All right, let's go to the next slide. So what we have, uh, yeah, and the, I went maybe a little bit too far. <laughs> this guy, and again, since this is goes to zero, right? This goes to zero. Okay. So let me, I guess, uh, one more time, get rid of this guy. Now, question is, how do we find tau? How do we find tau? We need to propose tau that would make the system stable. If tau is equal to zero, it is unclear the system is going to be stable. In fact, I, I don't know if we can prove it. I don't, I probably cannot. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, but probably not. At least not asymptotically stable. But if we choose tau to be equal to g minus kd q dot minus kpq, where kd and kp are both positive definite matrices, if that is what we choose, okay, we choose tau to have a gravity vector minus kd minus kp, then our we substitute here and we have our Lyapunov function to be equal to this guy. How? Well, we said before this component goes away, but now when we substitute g here, this component will go away. And what will remain is just, uh, let me use a different color, this guy, this guy, and this guy. Those are what will remain. And that is what we see here. So what we'll see is uh, quadratic form minus q dot kd q dot, very similar to last time. And uh, twice appearing kp, once with a minus sign, once with a plus sign. So they will go away. They will go away. So this, uh, let me just erase. So this whole part goes away. And what we have finally is uh, ex same expression as before. Minus kd multiplied by q on both sides, which is a negative semi-definite uh, form. So it is non-positive function. Is non-positive function. Let us just note uh, what we did here. Let us note what we did here. So what we did is uh, we choose control that can, uh, that offsets the gravity. We call it gravity compensation. G offsets the gravity here, makes it go away. So the final expression won't have gravity for a uh, Lyapunov function. Also, we added what we call PD control. Why PD? Proportional derivative control. This derivative part, proportional part. So you get uh, your distance to the origin and proportionally increased by KP. You get your velocity, you proportionally increased by KD. So this is proportional derivative for PD control with gravity compensation. Okay. And that 
uh, as you can see, uh, allows us to simplify to this uh, derivative of Lipnov function to this form. However, we still need to use LaSalle to prove something. And uh, we need to prove that there are no, uh, no fixed points, uh, no trajectories in the fixed point space other than Q equal to zero. So let's uh, let's consider that. So if we have this uh, this uh, expression for derivative of Lipunov function, so Lipunov function will, uh, derivative for Lipunov function will be equal to zero for zero velocity and any q. Now substituting uh, q dot and q double dot into the uh, then I guess uh, I should have put here, I guess, something like, um, yeah, let me, that was unfortunate omission. Let me just write here what we have, like dynamics. So it is H times DDQ plus C times DQ plus G equals to G minus KD times DQ minus KP times Q. Okay. Uh, right hand side here has to do with uh, what we chose as a control. Left hand side is our dynamics. So some components will go away because of the fixed points. Like this component goes away because Q, Q double dot is zero. This component goes away because Q dot is zero. This component goes away because Q dot is zero. So what we have is this expression downstairs. So now I think it makes sense. Sorry, I managed to <laughs> skip a quite important step, I think. Okay, so we have this component. G equals to G, we get rid of it, and we thus have, um, I guess, minus Kp, but we can say plus Kp is equal to zero. But Kp as before, full rank, so that means Q is zero. So Kp times Q is equal to zero, Kp full rank, Q is equal to zero. Okay, so the only trajectory as before in the fixed uh, space, or, you know, space of its points, there is a much better terminology in this field. I'm just using simplified words. Uh, it is something like invariant, invariant subset, something like this. Um, so the only trajectory in the space of fixed points that uh, is uh, valid is Q equal to zero. Therefore, the system is asymptotically stable by the LaSalle's invariance principle. Do you have questions about it? You sure no questions? Uh, is everything clear? OK. OK. And then let us go to the last uh, section. Uh, but before I just uh, reiterate, this is a PD control, this gravity compensation. That is what gravity compensation means when we use it uh, in terms of uh, control. Uh, you could do it mechanically. That is a famous, to uh, famous uh, topic of study, mechanical gravity compensation. But here we do it in terms of control. And the PD control, PD control is just like what we wrote here. And we've proven that this is stable. Okay. Now, last part. Ah, oh, wait. <laughs> one more. One more. Uh, one more remark. Now, often enough, you have linear dissipation force, viscous force. Sometimes we call it, and it appears in the uh, equations of dynamics. The way I've written. So it appears in the dynamical equations this way. 
uh, it happens when you have, for example, uh, viscous friction in your joints, which is very typical for uh, redu reducers, for mechanical reducers, um, reductor, uh, in mechanical reducers, in gearboxes, etc. You would often have viscous friction. So when you have linear viscous friction, you can use control without derivative component. So you can just say tau be equal to g minus kpq. And uh, stability will be achieved because your Lipnot function will then attain this form. Ultimately, f would take the role of kd. And it kind of looks like uh, it takes a row of KD, right? What is interesting here is that uh, this allows you to design control policies which do, do not involve Q dot. And Q dot is not uh, so easy to measure. Q is usually measured directly from encoders, let's say, from the sensors installed in the robot. Q, right? Q dot is usually estimated. You can estimate it as a derivative of Q, but that is not so easy, right? Uh, especially when you use uh, encoders. You can estimate it with state observers. Remember, we studied them in linear control course. So with state observers, you can estimate Q dot, but uh, it's much more difficult uh, than, you know, than not having to do with it, especially nonlinear observers. How do you use a nonlinear observer here? Well, clearly, you would, uh, for nonlinear observer, you would have to prove stability again with something like LaSalle's principle or something like that. And, uh, you know, sounds like a pain, right? Here, you can just avoid Q dot entirely, and you would have this nice proportional control with gravity compensation. Those used to be popular. I think they're probably still popular. The simple is the better. People like simplicity. Of course, in advanced uh, robotics applications, we don't do this kind of stuff. Like here we surrender our ability to control how fast we approach, how fast we approach origin we surrender to the viscous forces in the um, uh, in the joints. That is not how we usually prefer to do control. Okay, okay. Do we have example? Uh, do we have questions about this uh, proposition? Proportional control with gravity compensation for systems with dissipative uh, forces. Right. But do oh, we have any limitations yeah. on uh, choosing? Uh, I think it applies to both KP and KD. Uh, we know that they should be uh, uh, definite matrices. Positive but, matrices. Uh, yes, positive definite matrices. But uh, what are other limitations? Are they only come from uh, motors capability? Uh, or like no no motors like joints capability to uh, generate uh, some energy or how so uh there are two ways to approach this question mathematically speaking there are no other limitations on kp and kd whatsoever like in this problem the way i formulated it, you can choose anything right in practice uh, you have indeed motor uh, torque limits. Uh, sometimes motors uh, have a saturation in terms of uh, voltage, uh, other uh, various limitations. So the way we uh, can think about it is this. You can choose Kp to be anything, but you may need to make sure that it doesn't hit torque limits very often. If it hits a torque limit, the behavior of the tau will be completely different, right? And uh, you can no longer rely on your stability analysis. And if you are still sure the system will be stable, then you know go right ahead. Uh, it's fine. 
uh, but if you're not sure the system is stable after it hits torque limits, then uh, you are in trouble. So uh, how do we uh, reason about torque limits? The very simple way is to say, okay, here is a control error that I can expect. So how big Q is in this in this example? How big the Q is? And then you multiply it by Kp that you want to propose. You subtract it from G, and you find out how big tau is. If tau is, is bigger than what your motors can produce, you are in deep water. You're in trouble. But if uh, the result in tau is actually quite reasonable, then you are fine. So uh, that is one way of thinking about it. Uh, another way to think about it is, um, uh, how should I put it? Uh, sometimes Q, it, it will be on the next slides. There is artificial ways to keep Q small. Uh, and that is replace Q with control error. We will see it next slide. Uh, if we replace it with control error, we can say, okay, the only control errors I'm willing to deal with are very small errors. If the error is big, uh, we have to employ a different strategy. But if the error is very small, uh, we can say, okay, for this very small error, I can have QP, uh, Kp this big until it produces uh, some ridiculous uh, tau that I cannot really tolerate. Okay. So you can kind of like uh, design it two ways. You can say, okay, how big the control error do I tolerate? tolerate, tolerate? And uh, how big Kp I can allow myself to use here. So uh, there, there are those trade-offs. But with big Kps, the system often becomes less stable because Q is not just pure state. It is a state plus state estimation error. And state estimation error will be multiplied by Kp. And uh, often enough, we don't have observers here or anything like that that would keep the state estimation error uh, to zero. In fact, what we have is often just the error of measurement or time delay or something like this. And those things, especially time delays, they are not very nice for stability. So what will often happen is uh, you just have those components which you absolutely don't want to um, you know, amplify, but you are amplifying them with big gains. That is especially true for KD. KP is less of a culprit. KD is uh, usually uh, pretty bad. So what we want is to make as small gains as possible while retaining the performance where we want it to be. Um, somehow what happens often is that smaller gains lead to slack performance. So your performance isn't as good. Your robot kind of feels, uh, you know, not very energetic, let's say. Uh, with the bigger gains, performance is good, but sometimes it can become unstable and that is a catastrophe. <laughs> so you cannot allow is, uh, the robot to become unstable. Uh, that is a very serious matter. Like an unstable robot arm will just lash out and it can lead to injuries to real people. That is not a matter of, uh, you know, a matter of uh, human. You cannot allow it to happen. As in, uh, it is much better if the robot arm doesn't move at all, then it moves and injures someone. So you have to absolutely guarantee it never happens. Is uh, That is what instability for a robot arm can mean. Also, you can just destroy the product it works with or itself. Robot arm is expensive, so you don't want it to destroy itself. For airplane, instability means it crashes down. For a quadrotor, it flies into someone or, you know. For autonomous car, it hits something, right? So instability is a serious, serious matter. Um, so in practice, you often uh, consider uh, benefits of better, better performance versus guarantees of stability. And the uh, guarantees of stability in practice don't come from Laplace analysis like this. They come from robustness analysis. So we uh, want to not only guarantee for the model that we know exactly that it is going to be stable, 
we want to guarantee for the model that we know inexactly, including various things such as, for example, um, time delays uh, and uh, other things like external disturbances, etc. We want for all of them to not lead to instability. So somehow uh, there is a trade-off. You know, I'm not sure if I made you feel secure <laughs> because clearly no, you. Thank you. Yeah, no, no, it's a, yeah. I mean, it's clearly a field in its own how to choose those gains. Um, uh, but um, as far as the mathematics that I'm giving you here, you can choose any gain. In practice, you would want to choose smaller gain for your performance and so on. Okay. Uh, by the way, hopefully you would have a advanced uh, robotics class or advanced control, something like this, um, with Simeon. And uh, he will teach you, uh, for example, the, what do you call them? Uh, sliding mode control. And there, it is one way to deal with, uh, you know, not, uh, like taking the maximum performance out of your motors while being stable. Okay, good. Now let us move on. A any other questions about this one? No other questions. Okay, let us move on. Uh, let me, uh, how much time do we have? Can someone tell me how much time I do we have? I think like 40 minutes. 40? Or maybe, or, or, or no. Okay, good. So we have enough time. That is good. That's good. That's good. All right. Uh, no, not 40, 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Okay, good. It is sufficient. Uh, thank you. So now, uh, last important part of this lecture. So now we will study uh, how we can stabilize a trajectory, not drive the system to the origin, but stabilize a trajectory. Okay. So let us introduce a desired position Q star. Desired means, um, yeah, uh, I guess here it's not like a trajectory. Sorry, I'm uh, getting ahead of myself. No, yeah, uh, it's just we stabilize the point. Trajectory will come later. We we'll stabilize the point, uh, meaning we stabilize a, um, how do I put it? We stabilize a single uh position but not the origin somewhere else and this position somewhere else is q star we want to drive it there like you can imagine robot arms sits like this we want to, to sit like this that is not origin that is not origin but uh we want to do it right sounds reason and we introduce the idea of position error so the difference between current uh, desired position and current position so we want to be at the position q star we are at the position q the difference is Control error. Okay. Sorry, give me a second. Sorry, I forgot to turn off the fan. I think maybe our audio was a little bit uh, worse because of that. Hope now it is a little bit better. I hope you still could hear me, uh, the whole thing. Okay. I think now, it didn't change anything. Oh, so you, uh, right now, you, the audio stayed about the same as before? Yes. Oh, cool. Great. Uh, I'm glad. I'm glad. All right. Uh, so let us uh, consider how error dynamics uh, goes. So. We can hope. So we, right now we show our dreams, uh, right? And dreams and hopes. So uh, we want uh, the aerodynamics to evolve in accordance with uh, with this law, with law twenty three. So we want aerodynamics to go with accordance to law twenty three. Okay, law 23. Why? Well, we know 
because we studied it before that this system is stable as long as those guys are definite, positive definite, right? What does it mean for it to be stable? Well, it means that E will go to zero. It is asymptotically stable, so it drives to the origin, so E will go to zero. What does it mean for E to go to zero? If E goes to zero, it means that this difference goes to zero. So Q will go towards Q star. So our position will approach our desired position. That is, uh, you know, that's what we can achieve as long as uh, aerodynamics looks like 23. There is no guarantee it will look like 23, but we can hope that it will look like 23. That is, uh, that is our, uh, you know, our wish. Okay, so let's study it a little bit and see if we can make our aerodynamics actually behave like 23. So first of all, what is uh, e double dot? E double dot. Well, e double dot is uh, q star double dot plus q double dot. And by the way, here, I think, yeah, I think, uh, you know, in this formulation, I even allow I even allow the, uh, not just like stationary points, I allow a whole trajectory, as in uh, the system can evolve along a trajectory, not just go to a stationary point. If the point was stationary, then Q double dot star would be equal to zero, of course. Right? But uh, here I apparently allow Q double dot star to be anything. Okay, so it is a trajectory. It's not just a point. You can follow a trajectory here. If E goes to, uh, if E goes to zero, it means Q will follow Q star. Cool. Good. Uh, so, so this is what E double dot is. But we know what Q double dot is, right? And Q double dot is this guy. It is h inverse tau minus c dot uh, minus g. Okay. Well, that is what uh, Q double dot is. Good. Good, good, good. That allows us to uh, write our aerodynamics that we wanted to achieve to be like in this form. We just substitute here um, our um, you know e double dot which we expressed in this phase right? that is where it comes from now next step is we multiply all of this by h we multiply all of this by h uh, h is full rank uh, because uh, it is a uh, matrix of the kinetic energy, quadratic form matrix of kinetic energy. So it's full rank. So it means that uh, we can multiply it here, we multiply the whole equation by it. Um, it. It appears here. Here, this guy goes away because like H times H inverse the identity. And uh, we have in H appear also as well here. So that's where, where, it, where it is. Now, considering this equation, considering this equation, what can we do? Well, we can express what tau is supposed to be. We can express tau from here. So tau would be um, equal to h q double dot star plus c q dot uh, plus uh, g. Right. Where does those come from? Like you know, here and here we get them to. Uh, well, we leave them on this side. Minus the minus gives us plus. Q uh, tau goes to the right hand side, and that's how we get. It. And this whole, this whole thing here. 
uh, this whole thing here, it remains the same. Here it is. Okay. So that is uh, what, what, what we do here. So again, from here, we just express tau. It looks like this. Okay. So as long as we do it uh, this way, that is it. Uh, Q will go to Q's, Q star. Notice, no reason to use any complicated uh, Lyapunov analysis. Why? Everything extremely simple. What happens is, this is just original dynamics, notice. It is original dynamics, except here, instead of Q double dot, you have Q double dot star. But everything else is original dynamics. Here, it is uh, PG controlled, now with errors, not with uh, Qs. But it is scaled by H. So this this is called computer torque controller. This is called computer torque controller. Why computer torque? Because we just computed the torque that uh, sends us to the trajectory. So that is uh, computer torque control. It sounds scary simple, right? Uh, no uh, Lyapunov analysis, no anything, all very simple. There is a practical problem though. Uh, first, how do you do, do this? You have to know Q dot exactly, like precisely. If your Q dot is not known precisely, you're making errors here, and it is unclear what stability will entail. Uh, second, here, H, again, is not known exactly. Why? Well, because Q is not known exactly. So unless you know exactly what Q is, you cannot compute H exactly, and H is multiplying uh, those things. So it is kind of like errors and H will multiply somehow your uh, PD controller and clear where this will lead. So robustness analysis becomes a little bit difficult here, right? Um, those are not uh, simple things to answer. In practice, what people do is, let me just check if I have a second slide uh, going about it. No. Okay. Uh, so in practice, what people do often is this. They would get this thing and replace it with uh, what they call inverse dynamics. So they would just say, okay, this will be tau star. Uh, this will be the solution to the inverse dynamics problem. I will substitute here instead of Q, Q star, instead of Q dot, Q star dot, instead of Q, Q, uh, no, instead of C, uh, you compute C for Q, Q star, uh, Q star, Q star dot, even G will be computed using Q star. So all of those will be computed on the trajectory. Essentially, what you will do is you compute tau on the trajectory. And this whole uh, box will be replaced with tau computed on the trajectory. And here then, uh, this also H will be used computed on the trajectory. And this is the only real part where state enters. So if you uh, replace this guy on the left with um, something computed on the trajectory, and only on uh, this guy here, kind of in the right part of the equation, actually takes in the real state in form of the control error, then it uh, it is decoupled somehow, and you can at least uh, use the argument that it is the same as gravity compensation. Uh, to hopefully, hopefully have stability. There is a robustness argument uh, there. Like uh, you don't have to invoke uh, hopefully in your mathematics. You can do actual real math uh, where, you, where you say, okay, the error in how I obtain this model is bounded somehow. And we can prove that we, for some specific choice of uh, control, we will get uh, to origin anyway. But uh, 
you can see now like this simplicity that I showed you in the first place where we didn't have any Lepunov, uh, was everything was very simple, is deceitful. In practice, this is a difficult uh, control to work with. You have to replace this with something else for it to work, uh, as in with inverse dynamics, compute on the trajectory. This has to be computed on the trajectory. We lose all guarantees from Lepunov. And uh, then we have to think about robustness. So often when people say the computer controller is not useful in practice. As in, um, it, it has fallen out of fashion, I guess you can say. People don't use it uh, in industrial practice, as far as you know. And people don't uh, use it in uh, scientific practice. Uh, but knowing how it is constructed, I think, is very important uh, because it kind of illustrates uh, where uh, this is the ultimate form of model-based control. Here you use the whole model, every single part, and uh, it's supposed to work. But also shows how the model-based control breaks down because you ask for too much. You ask for knowing exactly everything to the last little detail, and that is impossible to impossible to do. In fact, even in gravity compensation, you can ask yourself, where exactly did you get this gravity vector from? What if I put a tiny speck of dust on your robot and the gravity changes? How much does this influence your control behavior? Right? Uh, airplane doesn't know how many passengers will board. It will still, it still should be able to fly. Right, uh, a robot doesn't know what uh, it will pick up. It still, should be able to pick it up, right? So somehow, uh, model-based control requires something more than just the simple reasoning, right? But the simple reasoning is important to see. This is uh, what it is. I suggest you read more in this book. I even put the chapter here. This is where you can see those reasonings repeated for various systems. And uh, then you can see uh, slightly more than robustness approaches. You would have a separate course on uh, those advanced topics. But, and you can see it is on uh, uh, robotics, advanced textbooks, and uh, I mean, I think as the, as the book is called Advanced Robotics, something like this. All right. So uh, this was like your introduction to basically use of Lepunov methods, um, use of Lepunov methods uh, in control. Do we have questions? Do we have questions? Right. If there are no questions, then uh, I think that's it. Uh, that is it for today's lecture. Uh, you will have a midterm on Wednesday. Uh, I think you uh, you know in practical aspects of the midterm. You can ask uh, Albert. Uh, he will uh, like give you details. But the midterm would not include this topic. Obviously, uh, I think we limited uh, midterm to the topics from the week before the before this one. So uh, the, the one before the last. Uh, so um, it's only the topics that you studied long ago, a long ago. Uh, it will take, I think, two hours. But again, uh, let's check with Albert. It's not very difficult. It's, uh, it's not very difficult. But uh, you have to be careful. You have to be careful. Uh, Meter will not include anything that you require computer to compute. Uh, even formulas that uh, I, can, you, I can reasonably expect you to have forgotten, I will give you, except the formulas from this course. So, like, for example, the formulas for the cross product, I'll give you at the end of the uh, list uh, that you would receive. But the formulas that you have, are supposed to remember from this course, they're not going to be given. So that is the kind of uh, situation you have. Uh, you know, uh, I suggest you quickly look through the lectures um, until, uh, like, you know, the previous, the week before the previous one. See if you find something that is 
difficult for you? That is something that's difficult to remember, difficult to understand, and so on, and study it. Uh, because uh, like, we, we attempted to cover most of the previous course, no, pre uh, previous parts of the course. So, you know, try to uh, clear up any anything that is remain that remained difficult. That's it for me. But uh, in terms of um, actually, there was a, a huge difference between uh, lecture and uh, labs materials. Mm -hmm. uh, not in terms of which topics we discussed, mm -hmm. but in terms uh, that um, uh, during the labs. Uh, we uh, uh, actually, uh, if we applied some of the knowledge taken from uh, lectures, it was uh, uh, very uh, like uh, not very simple. But uh, I mean, there were some primitive examples, mm -hmm. and um, there were uh, probably not much uh, examples during lectures. And uh, we do not uh, know what uh, what kind of tasks we should expect. Uh, would it be uh, like uh, derive some formula or uh, apply this uh, knowledge? For example, like uh, apply knowledge uh, of uh, Jacobians on the particular constructed uh, manipulator for you. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. probably. Uh, Structure, even structure, is not uh, like understandable. Mm -hmm. So uh, you will not have uh, to like um, how should I put it? There are tasks that are naturally ambiguous. So, for example, if I ask you write equations for a robot, uh, it is naturally ambiguous uh, unless I provide you a convention. And then say follow this convention to derive equations. So those types of types of tasks I'm not going to include. Uh, you know, we didn't study conventions too much, so those are not going to be included. So you won't have to like derive equations uh, of kinematics, for example, for a particular robot. But uh, we uh, there have been a few topics that uh, quite a few uh, where we studied uh, them completely as in. I can provide you a formal problem formulation and you will be able to solve it. And the uh, problem formulation would can contain all information that you can possibly need to solve those questions. So those will be the types of questions you would uh, have. All of it will be based on lecture materials. None of the midterm will be based on stuff that you haven't seen in the lectures. So zero amount of material from outside of the lectures will be on the midterm. Same for final exam. I personally write all of those. So I don't include anything that I don't cover in the lectures. Uh, and you, you, based on the what we cover in the lectures, you can kind of see uh, the biases you can expect in the midterm. But this is, I, I suggest, uh, again, you want to prepare, go through the lectures and just see what part of the lecture doesn't make sense and study it. That is the way to prepare. Because meter will be based on your understanding. Um, if you understand uh, like each aspect of the course, the most problems are kind of trivial. Uh, that is the way they're designed. Uh, they, they're designed to kind of like check understanding. Computationally, all of them are uh, simple. Uh, if you feel like you, uh, you know, you need to practice some of those, uh, you know, you can always uh, look at what we, you know, uh, see in the lectures and ask yourself what kind of uh, problem you can uh, come up with to illustrate it. Uh, almost all kinematics uh, link, kinematic links uh, problems can be, uh, uh, almost all kinematic link uh, problems can be solved, uh, oh, sorry, uh, can be like practiced with simple kinematic chains, like two-link robot, three-link robot, etc. cetera. Uh, I mean, as a uh, kind of like robotics professional, you would have to uh, test your own knowledge on, you know, kind of like your own examples. That is, uh, pr I mean, you, you can go to Sic Siciliano or, and uh, like this book, right? Or the book, sorry, to this book or the book that I suggest in the... Um, 
on Moodle in downstairs there is a book suggestions. Uh, go to any of those and uh, just look for examples they provide. But uh, my personal experience is you know exactly what kind of uh, robots uh, you can work with, right? Like two, three link robots, one link robot, etc. Just uh, write, write those and uh, check if you're understanding, uh, like if you, you can solve like, you know, Jacobian problems, problems for forward inverse kinematics and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, I, I'm not uh, if something was uh, studied last week, like inverse kinematics, I don't remember exactly when we finished. Uh, it is not going to be on, on the exam, but uh, yeah, uh, but uh, just, uh, just self study it uh, like this. If you are unsure if your answer is correct, plot it. Uh, I know visually, if you manage to, you know, like represent the same vector in the same frame, blah, blah, it would show, it would be able, you will be able to show it in the picture. And in fact, it, you know, it's kind of like, this is the whole point. Uh, this is the whole point. If, if you feel like you lack some sort of particular exercise, as in, you think, oh, this particular type of problem, I just don't know how to exercise with it. Like, I don't know how to train myself or whatever. Let me know. I will try to think if uh, there is a or find a way to to do it. But uh, first, look at the textbooks. Uh, see if uh, maybe they provide um, you know problems and exercises. That is my suggestion. But uh, ultimately, uh, none of the problems that I'm going to give you require like exercising. It is not like uh, integrals or differential equations where you kind of have to train yourself to uh, notice patterns and so on and so forth. Uh, the problems that we studied were much simpler than that. They only require understanding. That is my take, but uh, I'm not sure if uh, this is um, satisfactory. Yep, thank you. No, thank you. Any more questions? Okay, thank you guys, and we'll see each other on Wednesday. Bye-bye.